Hey everyone, this is Arjun. I'm one of the international medical graduates who is pursuing his internal medicine residency at the Cleveland Clinic main campus, Cleveland, Ohio. So today I wanted to share with you guys what I have learned throughout my first year of residency. And then I had also stayed in Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota for over a year and just wanted to share some tips and tricks which I've learned throughout my time in the US so that you guys can also set yourself up for success. So what is acculturation and why bother? I am not being paid by any company or any institution to do this video. So whatever I share is my opinion and I am not endorsing any of the services. So if you look up the definition of acculturation online, it will say assimilation to a different culture, typically a dominant one. If you're watching this video, I'm guessing you must have traveled from a different country to the United States and must be pursuing a residency of some sort here. So it's very important that you go through the process for your own social and psychological well-being, as you can see when you look this up on Google. In this picture, I am showing you pictures of two different soccer players. The one on your left is Dimitri Payet and the one on your right, most of you might know him, it's Christian Pulisic. So Dimitri Payet is originally from France, Marseille, France and moved to London, England to a club called West Ham. So in short, he changed his country from France to England. He used to speak fluent English and was really highly rated. But unfortunately, he developed homesickness. He really did not adjust to the culture in England. And then feeling homesick, he had to go back to France to his home club, Marseille. Now, on the other hand, you see Christian Pulisic. This is a boy who grew up in Hershey, Pennsylvania, United States. While he was fairly young as a teenager, he moved to Germany. I guess most of the people in Germany also speak English. English, he was able to really adapt to the system in Germany. He was not only successful in Germany, later he moved to England, where everybody obviously speaks English. But anyway, he won the Champions League. Point which I'm trying to make by showing these two pictures to you is irrespective of who you are or where you go, you must have been like handpicked because there are thousands of people who apply. Uh, but only few of them end up matching. So although you have the highest potential, you can be like Dimitri Payet, feel and feel homesick when you're halfway done through first year, or you can be like Christian Pulisic, set yourself up for success if you kind of like take one step at a time and know where you're going, where you're headed and what kind of challenges you might face. I guess three minutes into the video and with all my soccer metaphors, you're already like, why am I listening to all this? So let's start with our first question, how to be a strong intern. I'm pretty sure that during orientation, your chiefs is going to go through this and different people have different opinion. But if I'm to summarize my whole experience of like going through intern year, I would say being accountable is the most important thing which I learned during this particular year. So make sure that all your actions you are accountable for when someone asks you to do something or you're placing in an order, make sure that you're asking a lot of questions and go through your logical reasoning with your senior. Nobody is going to judge you during the first three or six months depending on the program where you are some programs are really busy others are less busy but in general take a few months to learn the system first learn the emr the electronic medical record system whether it's epic or cerner or something else make sure you know who your senior is where your workroom is where you go for lunch things like that simple things can make you successful like medicine is obviously something which you will be practicing throughout your career but this is more important like setting yourself up for success is more important so that's what i would say and of course be accountable for anything and everything you do taking this question a step further i would add the phrase as an img how to be a strong intern as an img it's not any different than an amg but like since you're starting, I'm guessing that you just moved from a different country to the United States. So it must be difficult, right? You might be a trained gastroenterologist in your country or might have been one of the best students in your medical school, but you need to show up for work. Like if you cannot figure out the transportation issues, like getting an Uber drive five in the morning might be difficult. So make sure the simple things are taken care of. You show up on time, you know, you know where to park, who to reach out to for questions. And simple stuff like that will set yourself up for success. So let's get started. The first thing which I'm going to deal in this video would be housing. So there are two ways to go about this. It depends on where you are and where you're from. You can either choose to buy a house or rent or lease a place. 
renting or leasing is very simple most of you will end up leasing an apartment maybe a studio apartment maybe a one bedroom apartment so make sure that you know when your lease ends and if you want to break the lease move to a different complex or someplace else make sure you know when to let them know like some people have a stipulation where this will say that 30 days prior to your lease ending you might have to let them know that you're moving so you cannot just show up there one day prior to your lease end and say that you're going to move the other option is buying a house that's much more complicated so if you do not have a family in the united states and you're just starting your career here i do not suggest that but definitely you will find some people in your own residency class doing it maybe second year or third year would be a time where you can consider this Life in the United States is almost unlivable without a social security number. Now that you're coming in on a visa or even if you have a green card, social security number is something which you will need. Make sure you fill up the SS5 form and carry enough identification with you. Usually you will need a passport with a valid visa, the DS-2019 if you're on a J-1 visa and the form i-797 if you are on an h-1b make sure you're carrying your i-94 which acts as a proof of entry into the united states and figure out where the nearest ssn office is and then you will just have to like show up there to the social security office with this filled up form and with all your documents and they will help you apply for an ssn next is finances when you're looking at finances there are like big banks like chase bank of america then there are smaller banks like credit unions or in my case in cleveland we have a bank called key bank you can either go with a bigger bank or a smaller bank depending on your aspirations and goals if you're considering moving for fellowship then going with a bigger bank makes more sense because they might have more branches elsewhere but most of the stuff is handled electronically so you can either opt for a bigger bank or a smaller bank doesn't really matter and and then the percentage amount you earn in a checkings or like a savings account is really, really low in the United States. So it doesn't really matter which bank you opt for. You can look into the fine print and do more uh, research based on wherever you are in the US and what options you have available. One thing to realize is credit card. The way money works in the US is different from other parts of the world. I am originally from India where if I had money, I could buy stuff using debit card. But in the United States, a lot of things will depend on your credit score and your, you will not have a credit score if you do not have a credit card. So it's of utmost importance to open a credit card as soon as you get your SSN. So SSN or social security number is the first step in the hurdle. And once you get it, you can apply for a credit card. There are several credit cards which are like beginner credit cards which you can start with i can leave a link uh, down in the video but i really found that discover credit card and chase freedom flex are like good cards to start with discover gives you the best chance of uh, like accepting as a new user specifically being from a foreign uh, country definitely begin by applying for a bank account and also have your first paycheck deposited into the bank account and then you can apply for discover apple credit card is also pretty good if you're an apple fan and it pays uh, if you use apple pay or if you have apple watch chase freedom flex is really good you have higher chances of acceptance if you have a chase bank account and then if you have a chase direct deposit setup bank of america cash rewards or other credit cards like the petal or capital one is also something you can look into i think good start cards to start with would be discover or the apple credit card and i can leave a video link down below Without a driver's license in the United States, you're really, really stuck. The transportation in the US is not best if you're not in a big city like New York City or Boston. So you are kind of stuck with having your own car or method of transportation. Maybe you live nearby the hospital, but if you don't and want to own a car to kind of uh, give yourself mobility, then driver's license is something which you will need. A special form of driver's license is the real ID. You can carry this real ID to a airport and then use the real id as an identification so basically you kind of skip the passport step you do not need to carry your passport if you have a real id it's a special type of driver's license with an embedded chip anyway so you if you are applying for a driver's license you need to show up to your dmv or bmv basically the motor vehicles office with the social security number passport and two forms of address proof unfortunately your renter's agreement might not be one of the document proofs you need so make sure you have an electric bill or an internet bill 
or maybe you have like a, the banking statement saying that you stay in this particular address, you show up with your visa paperwork, I-94, DS-2019, I-797, and then you apply for this driver's license. If you have a driver's license from outside the United States, make sure you bring it and then they can maybe expedite the process. And some states even allow you to drive Without a US driver's license, you need to look up your own state rules and regulations. Otherwise, it's fairly simple. If you have not driven in the United States before, I highly encourage you to like go through the manual, the BMV or the DMV manual to learn all the rules which applies to the United States and your particular state and then also take learning uh, like lessons because it might be a different hand drive. In India, it used to be a right hand drive for us. Now it's a left hand drive. But anyway, I suggest maybe four to six hours of formal road classes where you kind of go through someone who has been driving in the United States for a long time, maybe even practice a little bit with your friend. And then once you're comfortable, you can app uh, apply for the road test. The next big thing is to buy a car. In the United States, if you do not have a car, you're kind of landlocked, kind of stuck based on Uber or Lyft or other availability of taxis. So the best thing to do is to like look at deals. In general, leasing versus buying is always a question which everybody like asks. But right now with the market in June of 2022, it's really difficult to find a good deal. Leases are difficult to find. Even buying a car is really challenging. Like some wait times are like up to two or three months. So you will have to kind of do your own research and ask your friends to see who has been uh, successful in buying a car from a particular dealership. In general, leasing the concept, if it's new to you, they will specifically give you a year term and a mild term. So either you own that car or you have that car for three years and for 10,000 miles every year. So you can total drive maybe 30,000 miles in those three years. Once you're either over three years, irrespective of the miles you give away the car or you're over 10,000 miles, uh, into three, that's 30,000, you give away the car, even if you have like, driven it at one and a half years and you're over the mileage. And once you return the car, if there are like scratches and bumps and this and that, so that might add to additional cost. So finding a good lease might not be that easy right now in June of 2022, but your luck might vary. So make sure uh, you find for good deals and then buying is obviously simple. So you go up, you show up. I'm guessing like you don't have adequate amount of cash. So what I would suggest is make sure uh, you go to kellybluebook.com to look up the exact pricing of the car. So one of the cars MSRP might be 30,000, but the car might be going for 36,000 right now. So it's go to Kelly Blue Book and see what the car is selling on an average. Maybe even if you're considering buying an old car, like a second hand car, you can go to Kelly Blue Book, kind of enter the details and look up exactly how much it costs. So like a two wheel versus four wheel versus the year of make, you can look all of that up in kdbluebook.com and I will uh, leave a link below. The other thing to consider would be to take a mechanic with you and this is highly recommended. I did not buy a second hand car, but if you're buying a second hand car, take a mechanic with you to make sure that they do a full inspection of the second hand car before you give the heads up. The next thing is taxes. So make sure you know what to do when the tax time is up. Usually it's around April 15th when it's the deadline. Sometimes it gets delayed to like May or something. But prior to April 15th, you are going to get a W-2 from your employer, which kind of goes through how much tax they deducted from your um, uh, salary and how much tax you were supposed to pay. So make sure you wait for all of these things. The employer is going to send all of those documents in your mail, usually around February. Now for J-1 visa people, make sure you go through sprint tax because do not go through TurboTax, especially at the beginning, the first two years do not use TurboTax. Especially for the first two years, TurboTax is going to underestimate the amount of tax you're required to pay, so you will get more returns, and it's kind of lucrative, right? You're seeing a return of $2,000, which you're gonna get back as tax returns, but usually that's wrong. Go through Sprint Tax, specifically for J-1 visa people, I'm saying it out loud twice now, go through sprint tax, maybe after two years when the rules kind of change and they start holding out more taxes, that's when sprint tax website is going to transfer you to TurboTax. If you're not on a J1, if you have H1, green card or something else, you can go through TurboTax. If you are a married or if you have children or like some other thing which is going to affect your tax return, I highly suggest going through a professional. 
Another hot topic which everybody wants to know about is moonlighting. Now, usually moonlighting is not allowed on a J1 visa. There are a couple of institutions who kind of play around the rules where you are able to do like extra shifts, which is technically not considered moonlighting. But usually if you're on a J1, you cannot moonlight. Now, if you're an H1B, you must have already taken step three and you need to apply for a separate licensure. Now, this is usually allowed during PGY2s, PGY3. It kind of varies based on the program year to year. Reach out to your chief residence and ask what the current rules are. As an IMG, vacation is going to revolve around renewing your visa. If you're an H1 or a J1 and your visa needs to be renewed because the date stamp on your visa is expiring, then make sure when you're scheduling your vacation, you have enough time to go back to your home country, set up for a visa interview, get the new stamp and come back. So that would usually take 14 days to 21 days. So make sure you plan your vacation accordingly. And as far as visa requirements go, J1 people usually get DS 2019 renewed every single year. And H1B is usually valid for two years if I am not wrong. So you will have to kind of plan your vacation around renewing your visa stamp and then make sure you get your new DS 2019 every year before July. I got my DS 2019 in February. Uh, and my year started in July, so like four or five months before, but usually it should you should get it by April. And from what I believe, H-1B visa holders would get their I-797 or the visa form about maybe six months prior to their visa renewal. All right, this was a long video. Feel free to leave your questions down below in the comment section and I will try to get back to them as soon as I can. I would like to end this video on a high saying that you have made it, you have been selected, you are in the United States of America. So breathe, step back, look at the bigger picture and count your blessings. Good luck.